Namo Tassa Bagoato Ara Namo Tassa Namo Tassa Bagoato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tassa Bagoato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay. So this evening, we are going to take a look. We're going to take a look at how the Buddha was teaching in a close way to the people. So I chose to use Majjhima Nikaya number 54, and this is the Pataliya Sutta to Pataliya. Now the Buddha had an interesting way of teaching with similes and lists in, con in uh, cooperation with the Four Noble Truths. You may have heard me say before that in most of the suttas, if you listen carefully, that you will be able to pick out the Four Noble Truths that are being used in the framework of the sutta. So let's see what happens with this one. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the country of the Angudara Pans, where there was a town of theirs that was named Apana. And then when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, he went to Apana for alms. And when he had wandered for alms in Apana and had returned from his alms round after his meal, he went to a certain grove for the day's abiding. Having entered that grove, he sat down at the root of a tree. Hatalia, the householder, while walking and wandering for exercise, wearing full dress with parasol and sandals, he also went to that grove. And having entered the grove, he went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. And when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he stood at one side. And the Blessed One said to him, there are seats, householder. Sit down if you like. When this was said, the householder Pataliya thought to himself, the recluse Godama addresses me as householder. He was angry and displeased, but he remained silent. The second time, the Blessed One said to him, there are seats, householder, sit down if you like. And the second time, the householder Pataliya, he thought the recluse Godama addresses me as householder. Oh, angry and displeased, he remained silent. A third time, the Blessed One said to him, there are seats, householder, sit down if you like. And when this was said, the householder thought to himself, the recluse Gotama addresses me as a householder. And he was angry and displeased. And he said to the Blessed One, Master Gotama, it is neither fitting nor proper that you should address me as a householder. Householder. You have the aspects, the marks, and the signs of being a householder. Nevertheless, Master Godama, I have given up all my works and cut off my affairs. In what way, householder, have you given up all your works and cut off all your affairs? Master Godama, I have given all my wealth and grain, silver and gold to my children as their inheritance. I do not advise or blame them about such matters, but merely live on food and clothing. And that is how I have given up all my works and cut off all my affairs. Householder, 
the cutting off of affairs as you describe it is one thing, but in the noble one's discipline, the cutting off of affairs is different. What is the cutting off of affairs like in the noble one's discipline, venerable sir? It would be good, venerable sir, if you, the blessed one, would teach me the Dhamma, showing what the cutting off of affairs is like in the noble one's discipline. Then listen carefully, householder, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, Patalia the householder replied, and the blessed one then said this. Householder, there are eight things in the noble one's discipline that lead to the cutting off of affairs. What are these eight? With the support of non-killing of living beings, the killing of living beings is to be abandoned. That's the first one. With the support of taking only what is given, the taking of what is not given is then abandoned. The second. With the support of truthful speech, false speech is to be abandoned. The third. With the support of unmalicious speech, malicious speech is to be abandoned. That's the fourth. With the support of no rapacity and greed, lust and greed. Lust and greed are to be abandoned. That's the fifth. With the support of no spite and scolding, spite and scolding are to be abandoned. That's revenge and scolding. That's the sixth. With the support of no anger and irritation, anger and irritation are to be abandoned. With the support of non-arrogance and arrogance is to be abandoned. And these are the eighth. So those are the seventh and eighth ones. These are stated in brief without being expounded in detail that lead to the cutting off of affairs in the noble one's discipline. Venerable sir, it would be good, blessed one, if you would expound to me in detail these eight things that lead to the cutting off of the noble one's, cutting off of affairs in the noble one's discipline. which have been stated by you in brief at this time, blessed one, without being expounded upon in detail. Then listen closely to me, sir. Potalia, the householder replied, yes, venerable sir. And the blessed one then said this, with the support of non-killing of living beings, the killing of living beings is to be abandoned. So we say not to kill any living being. So it was said, with reference to what was this said, here a noble one considers thus, I am practicing the way to the abandoning and the cutting off of the fetters because of which I might kill living beings. And if I were to kill living beings, I would blame myself for doing so. The wise, having investigated, would censure me for doing so. And on the dissolution of the body after death, because of killing living beings, an unhappy destination would be expected. But this killing of living beings is itself a fetter and a hindrance. And while the taints and vexation and fever might arise through the killing of a living being, there are no taints or vexation and fever for one who abstains from killing living beings. So this is basically explaining that if we break this precept, we will have a vexation and fever that might arise to interrupt our practice. This is where the hindrances come with restlessness, guilt, and remorse. 
And so it was in reference to this that it was said with the support of non-killing of living beings, the killing of living beings is to be abandoned and the hindrances will no longer come up in your practice. This is the direct relationship. This is what we mean by choosing these suttas very carefully when we built the sutta index that we're working on because they have to be something that affects directly the success or the failure of the person's meditation. Does it disturb it or does it support it? And trying to explain how all these things are happening. We then look at the support of taking away what is given and the taking away of what is not given is to be abandoned. So it was said, and then this paragraph, it repeats itself for if you were to take what is not given or steal something, then what has happened is you would not only be censured and criticized, but on the dissolution of the body after death because of killing, I'm sorry, because of taking what is not given, you would end up in a happy, unhappy destination. And the, it is not only that, but during the time you're practicing in this lifetime, you would face the vexation and irritation of these hindrances coming up to bother you. With the support of unmalicious speech, the malicious speech is abandoned. So it was said, and the same thing applies in that case. And with the support of no more lust and greed, lust and greed are to be abandoned, which always cause problems and the arising of craving and clinging mental proliferation. And this is goes on and on the same exact way with the support of no spite. And that is no anger, holding a grudge. Spite is holding a grudge against someone for something that happened and scolding. The spite and scolding are to be abandoned. And if they're abandoned, then you don't have the tension coming up and you're replacing it with forgiveness and compassion and loving kindness. We'll talk about that in just a second. With the support of no anger and irritation, the anger and irritation may be abandoned. This occurs by simply stopping taking everything so personally, practicing taking everything impersonally. And then when you let it go, then you are not faced with the threat of these uh, hindrances coming up. And the irritation will be abandoned that is what is said. And with the support of non-arrogance, the arrogance is to be abandoned. And so it was said, and with reference to what was this said, here the noble disciple considers, I am practicing the way to the abandoning and cutting off of all of those fetters because of which I might become arrogant, prideful, arrogant. And I, if I were to be arrogant, I would blame myself for this. The wise having investigated, they would censure me for this and on the dissolution of the body after death because of being arrogant and unhappy destination would be expected. And, but this arrogance is itself a fetter and a hindrance and uh, while ta taints and vexation and fever might arise through the arrogance, there are no taints or vexation or fever in one who is not arrogant. So it is with reference to this that it was said with the support of non-arrogance, arrogance is to be abandoned. Now, when you're reading this, it's kind of worth it. I went through all of the notes and it's worth reading that. I think there's three notes involved with that. Now, when you're taking this and you're abandoning it, this is where you're practicing right effort. And let's be clear, uh, one of the things that happens with the hindrances um, these uh, is that when the hindrances are coming up, I think I, I'm not sure if I showed you a diagram I had of just drawing a line like this and crossing a line over like that, okay? And so on the left side of your, your, ac, your cross that you just did, it's an even size one, you would on the left side, you would write lust and greed, on the right side, you would write hatred and aversion, okay? And on the top, you would write 
restlessness, guilt, and remorse. And on the bottom of that, you would write sloth and torpor. In the middle, in the middle of the circle, you would put the word doubt. And then you would point an arrow in from each one of these, these effects. So anytime one of those hindrances come up, they don't come up by themselves. And very often those four other hindrances will lead to you frustration, irritation, anxiousness, and then doubt. And doubt comes in if these things are giving you trouble because you're trying to stop them. But remember, we said that the practice goes very smoothly and very easily down the path if we understand how everything works. And what we said about the nutriment for the hindrance was if we pay attention to it, like trying to make it stop. And that's all we do and try to come back. It will come back again, or we will have to hold ourselves in this position while we try to meditate over here or push it away and have that part pushing it away or pushing it down, subduing it while we try to meditate. None of this is making sense when the meditation is something you're supposed to be doing by non-doing. Okay, you're supposed to be stepping away from personally trying to control anything. You're supposed to be moving it out of the way and watching what can happen if we don't engage or indulge in the action of mind becoming involved with any of these hindrances. This is really important. And so we, we, we fine tuned it, we went to certain suttas, we found out the operation of the sutta, uh, of the, in the sutta tells us that the operation of the hindrance itself, how does it work? I feed it <laughs> when I go to it and move away from what I'm doing in my meditation. If I move away from the breath, I'm then involved with the hindrance. If I move away from loving kindness, I am then involved with the hindrance. It doesn't matter which one of the meditations you're doing. If you're saying, I'm going to, I'm a breath meditator, I'm going to sit for three, four hours. Let's see if you actually do that or how many times something arises that attempts to pull you away. And if that's happening, that you are being pulled away, then you are paying attention to it. If there is any, and this is especially for the Vipassana practitioner who is paying attention very often to the body and feeling any tension in the body anywhere, this is where this comes in handy. This comes in very in a wise way, because if you were paying attention, now I'm saying step away and stop paying attention to the body or any tension in the body at all. But if you do detect it, then that's a signal that you're catching for what? For craving arising. And when the tension arises, it's always I something. I don't like this. I don't want this. Or I want this and I have to have it. It's liking it and uh, wanting it and attachment. Or it's disliking it and not wanting it and aversion. And then we become obsessed with wanting again it to stop. So see all that tension is there. So the question the Buddha was asking himself is how far does all of this go if I stop doing anything? And so we find uh, groups of suttas that describe how he was trying so hard. And then when he stopped, everything changed. And you go to 36, Najim and Akai number 36, and look in section 30, that's where he discovers that certain things are okay when they're happening if they're not about I, me, my, and mine. And that's where he changes his mind about how he's going to do this. And that's when he becomes enlightened.
So here in section 14, the eight things that led to the cutting off of affairs in the noble one's discipline have now been expounded in detail to you, but the cutting off of the affairs in the noble one's discipline has not yet been achieved entirely in all the ways. So he's going to go in more to explain. Venerable sir, how is the cutting off of affairs in the noble one's discipline achieved entirely in all ways? It would be good, venerable sir, if the blessed one would teach me the Dhamma, showing me how the cutting off of affairs in the noble one's discipline is achieved entirely in all ways. Mm. <clears throat> So then listen, householder, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir, Patalia, the householder replied, and the blessed one said this. Householder, now we have an example of a simile, so listen carefully. <clears throat> <clears throat> Suppose a dog overcome by hunger and weakness was waiting at the butcher shop and then a skilled butcher or his apprentice would toss the dog a well-hacked and cleaned skeleton of meatless bones just smeared with blood. What do you think, householder? Would that dog get rid of the hunger and the weakness by gnawing such a well-hacked and cleaned skeleton of meatless bones smeared with blood? No, venerable sir. Why is that? It is because that was a skeleton of well-hacked, cleaned, hacked, meatless bones smeared with blood. Eventually the dog would reap weariness and disappointment. And so too, householder, a noble considers thus. Sensual pleasures have been compared to a skeleton by the Blessed One. They provide much suffering and much despair. And while the danger in them is so great, he avoids the equanimity that is diversified based on diversity and develops the equanimity that is unified based on unity, which has clinging to the material things of the world utterly ceases without remainder. So he works to let go of any concern about this type of thing. Now, I look at this and I can say that in our training that to have just the bones and the blood and some of a little bit of flesh on the bones, but not to have all the pieces of the Dhamma connected the way they're connected in the retreats, I can see the difference. And that I would grow weary and anxious and irritated at not being able to progress if I only understood the part about hindrances, but I hadn't learned the part about anatta or I hadn't learned the part about all three, anicca, dukkha, or anatta, you see? So learning how all that works and the dependent origination works and understanding path are like the pieces of these different uh, types of uh, similes. So too, householder, a noble disciple considers this, sensual pleasures have been compared to the skeleton while the danger in them is great. Having seen this, Thus, as it actually is with proper wisdom, he then avoids the equanimity that is diversified where you're going all over the place based on diversity. He develops equanimity that is unified in the present time, okay? Based on this unity, where clinging to the material things of the world and utterly ceases without remainder. Why? because we're teaching you to take and look at every sense experience. This is not me, this is not mine, this is not myself. This is just the eye operating or the ear or the nose or the tongue or the body. But it is not me, it is not mine, it is not myself. And when it arises, that experience is there and then it disappears, I am still here. So it cannot be me, it cannot be mine, it cannot be myself. Here comes the second one, a householder, suppose a vulture, a heron, or a hawk 
seized a piece of meat and flew away. And then the vultures, the herons, and the hawks pursued it and pecked and clawed at it. What do you think, householder, if that vulture, that heron, or the hawk does not quickly let go of that meat? Wouldn't it incur death and deadly suffering because of that? It would. It would. Yes, venerable sir. And so too, householder, a noble disciple considers thus. Sensual pleasures have been compared to a piece of meat by the, the Blessed One, and they provide much suffering and much despair. And while the danger is great in them, having seen this, thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, that means understanding it. And it also refers to understanding through watching how the event happens and understanding the craving and clinging to material things of the world will utterly cease without remainder if we cease to do that kind of thing and grabbing hold of things, you see? for the same reason that I just explained. Householder, suppose a man took a blazing uh, grass torch and he went and ran, he ran against the wind with this torch. What, what do you think, householder, if the man does not quickly let go of the blazing grass torch, wouldn't the blazing grass torch burn his hand or his arm or some other part of his body so that he might incur death or deadly suffering because of that. You ever watch a person who's caught fire running against the wind and it burns ferociously down their back, tears them apart. Can't do that. Yes, venerable sir. So in this case, they're going against a direct set of instructions about grass torches. In the case of the meat, the birds are trying to carry it, this heavy piece of meat, and it, they're only going to fall down to the ground. They can't, they can't do it that way, which the instructions for the birds somewhere says, grab the meat and run, but be sure you get the right size piece when you go. Okay. Yes, venerable sir, he says. The householder, noble disciple, considers sensual pleasures have been compared to the grass torch by the Blessed One. They promote, provide much suffering and despair when the danger is in, in them is great. Having seen this in this way, as it actually is with proper wisdom, then why don't we stop? But we pursue it and get continually involved in the craving and the clinging and the holding on. It's habitual. We've been doing it all our life. We have to understand the rules of how this works in order to understand. We have to trust. We have the instructions, test them for ourselves, and then just let go and not get involved anymore and change our path. So this can, noble disciple considers thus, that this provides suffering and much despair and the danger is so great that having this way, the, the grass torch, you would get burned if you ran against the wind. Because why? Because if you've been instructed properly in the village, you know that the air feeds the fire. So you don't give it more air. You lie down against the sand or the dirt and you roll and puts out the fire. Householders suppose there were a charcoal pit deeper than a man's height of glowing coals without flame or smoke, but the man came and he wanted to uh, the a man came who wanted to live and not die, who wanted pleasure and recoiled from pain. Two strong men seized him by the arms and dragged him towards the charcoal pit. What do you think, householder? Would that man twist his body this way and that and struggle? Yes, venerable sir. And why is that? Because the man knows that if he falls in the charcoal pit, he will incur death and deadly suffering because of falling in the pit. And so in the same way, this noble disciple considers that sensual pleasures have been compared to a charcoal pit by the blessed one. And they provide such suffering and much despair while the danger in them is so great. Having seen this thus, 
as it actually is with proper wisdom, clinging to the material things of the world utterly ceases as a desire in him. It just ceases without remainder because he begins to see that running to the pit and the feeling that tension. He feels it in life when he gets in an argument or he has a a distraction or an angry situation is the same feeling. Pretty soon he decides that feeling is unwholesome. It is an imperfection of mind. I'm going to let go of that and see what happens if I don't take this immediately so seriously. You know, the statistics on human beings living in psychology, psychiatry, we know is like 85, 90% of the people are just reacting, reacting, reacting. So this is right there. That's what the research is saying. 85, 85 is I think the highest one I saw. 85 of the people just react. And where do the reactions come from? Not from the present time. Sometimes I don't have anything to do with the present time situation. They have to do with how you felt in the past of a similar feeling situation. And this must be it. And I have to throw this out because this is what it must be. So we're basically more sophisticated than that as human beings. And once we understand the rules of how this works, then we need to see that's a spot to pause. So suppose a man dreamt about lovely parks and lovely groves and lovely meadows and lovely lakes. And on waking up, he saw nothing of it. So too, householder and noble disciple considers sensual pleasures that have been compared to a dream by the blessed one. And they provide much suffering and much despair while the danger in them is great. What danger? It pulls you away from everything that's actually happening in the present time if we linger, linger with these things. Having seen this as it actually is with proper wisdom, he evaluates it. And then he, instead of clinging to the things of the world, he other, his mind starts to stop. But your mind will never functionally change. See, ch here's the thing. Up until I think 12 or 15 years, the way I understand it, back then, I can remember growing up with this. No, you can't change. I've heard people fight about this. And men do it to them in when men are working together in a, uh, and on a crew, somebody will get mad at what's wrong with you? Why do you always have to do this this way? Always pick a fight, always do that. Well, this is what's happening to that man in that group, that work crew group. He's getting caught and it feels threatening, just like when his papa whipped him in the back barn when he was bad. And he's floating up from the past and grabbing hold and throwing it out and feeding his dislike and his craving and clinging start to carry him through again on the same thing. Anything new? No. Is he living a new life day to day? No. He's caught in a cycle his brain has been trained into. What you are trained into, you can be trained out of. That's what they know now. You're not stuck. You're actually much more powerful than you know, much more powerful than you know, because what you think and ponder on becomes the inclination of your mind, becomes the words you speak, becomes the direction you go, becomes the deeds you do. You are steering a ship, whether you like it or not, and nobody else can steer it but you. So the point is, whatever, it's a good lesson to look at the problems we have today with the climate, with, the, with war machines, with weapons, with anything you want to talk about. We made the sets of decisions in times and we made decisions and got ourselves here. We can make different decisions and change and go ahead. But if we keep dwelling and caught in our personal way of behavior, because that's what I always do, who cares? You can change, you can change. It's a great gift he brought us. So having seen this, they practiced letting go and then the, the things uh, clinging to material things and clearing to, clinging to ideas just utterly ceases without remainder. 
The next one is suppose a man borrowed goods on loan, a fancy carriage of fine jeweled earrings uh, pre preceded to, and surrounded by those borrowed goods. He went to the marketplace and the people, they were seeing him and they would say, oh, look at that is a rich man. Um, that is how the rich enjoy their wealth. Then the owners, whenever they saw him, they would take back their things. And what do you think, householder? Would that be enough for that man to become dejected? Yes, venerable sir. And why is that? Because the owners took back their things. So too, householder, a noble disciple, considers that the sensual pleasure have been compared to borrowed goods by the blessed one. And they provide much suffering and much despair while the danger in them is great. Having seen this, thus as it actually is with proper wisdom and clinging to those material things of the world, if he let, stops clinging to those material things to the world, uh, uh, utterly will cease without remainder. He has to replace it though. Please remember that in your steps of right effort, you recognize the tightness that's happening in the situation. You let go and you relax your head and mind. You just relax and try to get back to the present moment. You, you uh, let go and relax. Then you smile and come back to where the present moment in your life, the present time in your life of what's happening. And look at what's real. And then decide what's really happening. And then make a decision that brings comfort and happiness to the people around you, the person involved and yourself. See if you can find the elegant solution, the elegant solution. So householders suppose there were a dense grove far from a village town and within which there was a tree that was laden with fruit, but none of its fruit had fallen to the ground. And then a man needing fruit, seeking fruit and wandering around in search of fruit, he entered the grove and saw the tree laden with the fruit. So thereupon he thought this tree is laden with fruit, but none of its fruit has fallen to the ground. I know how to climb a tree. So let me climb this tree and eat as much fruit as I want. Fill my bag, take it with me. And he did so. Then a second man came needing fruit and seeking fruit and wandering in search of fruit and taking a sharp ax. He took to entered the grove and saw the tree laden with the fruit. And thereupon he thought, you know, this tree is laden with fruit, but nobody's, the fruit hasn't fallen to the ground. I do not know how to climb a tree. So let me cut the tree down at its roots and eat as much fruit as I want and fill my bag. And he did so. What do you think, householder, if that first man who had climbed the tree, if he doesn't come down quickly when the tree falls, wouldn't he break his hand or his foot or his leg or some part of his body so that he might incur death and deadly suffering because of that? Yes, venerable sir, he would. So too, householder, a noble disciple considers this way, sensual pleasures have been compared to fruits on a tree by the blessed one and they provide much suffering and much despair, while the danger in them is great. Having seen this thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, properly understanding how all of this works, he avoids the equanimity that is diversified based on diversity and develops the equanimity that is unified to what he is in the present time. Based on that unification, where clinging to the material things of the world utterly will cease and without remainder, is backing up and looking more and more clearly what is really going on, what is really happening, what is this really all about. So now, based upon the same supreme mindfulness whose purity is due to equanimity, this noble disciple will now be able to recollect his past lives. Now, how come he's able now 
after he's been working through seeing these things and doing his meditation, how come when he gets to equanimity, then he is able to recollect his manifold past lives if he sits quietly and just thinks what happened this morning for breakfast, what happened last night, what happened the night before I went to bed, what happened in the evening, what happened for dinner, and he keeps doing that, like just that, and he keeps going back and mind says, oh, I don't have anything else to do. I don't have any grudges or anger. I don't hate anybody or want to get back at anybody right now. And I feel free from guilt and I've kept my precepts and my mind is clear. And this is how this happens. Someone said to me, how does this happen? This is how this happens. Then, you know, he uh, thus with there was aspects and particulars he recollects his manifold past lives, depending on what you're doing it for the reason you've decided to do this practice or what exactly you're doing with it is directly proportional to how much of the past life you will see or not see when you try to do that. But very few people get to the place where they have really taught their brain to stop and then just watch. And so the brain isn't got the right conditions for this kind of a practice to work. And this is why so few people can actually ever have that experience. Now, based upon the same supreme mindfulness, whose purity is due to equanimity with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, the no noble disciple sees be beings passing away and reappearing. They were inferior, superior, fair or ugly, fortunate or unfortunate, and he understands how beings pass on according to their actions. This is actually a practice where if you've done some of the past lives, the next thing the teacher might say, if he sees that you've actually been able to do that, you have actually let go of enough that when you sit down, nothing starts to, to move in the, in the mind that moves towards craving and clinging. You have stepped away, away from I, me, my mind to just, this is just what's happening in front of me. It will, isn't there, I watch it, it will arise, it will be there, it will pass away. That's all. And the description of that is happening in 111. If you look in the description of each one of the jhanas, where Sariputta explains, I was able to see what wasn't there. And then I was able to see what came up, what was there and how long it lasted. And then it wasn't there, it is there, it arises and then it passes away. He describes it in every single jhana where that's still able to happen. He describes it. And that's exactly what happens when you practice with tranquil wisdom and insight meditation. And they come and say, oh, I saw this, I saw that. Yep, that's because you got out of the way. Okay, so these things are possible to happen as long as what? As long as the mind is not falling into its habit of the past or the future. Now, what is really wrong with us? And I had a student up in New York City and he had me laughing so hard the other night because he told me what's wrong with everybody. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've never heard of this before. And he said, no, no, no. This friend of his, he's a psychologist and he came and he said, I have figured out what's wrong with people. And he said, what is it? It's a condition which is rampant as much as COVID-19. It is rampant in the world amongst all human beings. They are suffocating. They're suffocating from paralysis of analysis. <laughs> paralysis of analysis is a serious condition. What does it mean? You're paralyzed to just be in the present time because of analysis. Your mind is so used to wanting to know how does it happen? Why? Your big one is why is it happening? And why tumbles into what we call papancha sanya sanka. Vitaka is when the thought first comes up. Vichara is when it spreads out and folds into other stories. And the papancha is I love that word. Papancha is your mind. You can close your eyes and say, if you're all confused someday, your husband comes home, he says, how are you doing? I'm, oh, papancha, papancha.
papacha, papacha. I got home and the flood is in the house and I had to clean it all up. Your mind is going boom, 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 boom. See, that's papancha. And the sanka is, is another one right afterwards and another one. And this uh, sankara is papancha sanya sankara. The papancha sanya is perception of this one, perception, perception, perception. And the sanka means it goes, <laughs> spreads out. And each one of these is a circle of dependent origination. And then your mind is going to explode. And then you remember, Sister Kema, you're a suffering in tech. It's bad as epilepsy. Paralysis of analysis has attacked me. <laughs> so let yourself go. Never mind it. Laugh at it. It's habitual, habitual tendency. The next one here is based upon the same supreme mindfulness whose purity is due to equanimity by realizing for himself with direct knowledge, that means you're watching, you're realizing something by direct knowledge, experience of seeing it, witnessing it. This noble disciple here and now he enters upon, he abides in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom. Oh, what is wisdom? Dependent origination, witnessing dependent origination, seeing it happen. Okay, seeing it happen and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. If the taints are destroyed, everything stops with the I and uh, me and my and my, it turns off, you see? Now we're talking, what are we talking about? We're talking about the condition you have to reach before you fall into cessation, that one, yeah. And if, you know, I have people tell me, oh, I was in neither perception or non-perception. And are you sure you really mean that? <laughs> you perceive that you were in non-perception? Okay, that's such a delicate state. I don't know, you know, if I was home by myself and someone described this to me in the beginning, I don't know if I would have understood it at all. And maybe, I would have thought that I was there, and but I couldn't have been there if I was just going on and on and on about it. You know, I couldn't have because I would. I know I was there. How do you know? You can't perceive anything. <laughs> it's not not perceiving, but it's not perceiving. The cue to not being at neither perception or non-perception is very simple, really. You reach a point in at, from nothingness, moving into neither perception or non-perception. And you get to a point, then all of a sudden, next sitting in that in that level of confusion, and you come out and start questioning. It's like, was I sitting? Oh, or was I not sitting? Was I sleeping? No, I was sitting. No, I could have been sleeping. <laughs> I was sitting. And you go back and forth like that. But the, you're supposed to, when you're, in, you're on the floor sitting or in a chair, just come out gently, very gently. And then you can let things roll through, come out. What happened? Ask your mind, what happened? That's all. And just sit there and maybe you'll see what you saw. Let it go, relax, smile, come back. Let it go, relax, smile, come back. Let it go, relax, smile, come back. So what are you doing? You're cleaning out to get to just the not, nothing's there state in order to be able to fall. Yeah, that's what you're actually trying to do. You're trying to not be there. You know that thing I say to you, try to experience an experience of no experience. <laughs> that's what you want to do, experience an experience of no experience and not get caught by paralysis of analysis. <laughs> that's what you have to do. Okay, so now um, at this point, the householder, the cutting off of affairs and the noble one's discipline has been achieved entirely and in all ways. But what do you think, householder? Do you see in yourself any cutting off of affairs like this cutting off of affairs and the noble one's discipline when it is achieved entirely and in all ways? And he says, venerable sir, who am I that I should possess any cutting off of affairs entirely in all ways like that 
in the noble one's discipline. I am far indeed, venerable sir, from that cutting off of affairs completely in the noble one's discipline when it has been achieved entirely in all the ways you describe. He was able to cut off his household business. He was able to give away his money, give away his house and become uh, a wanderer. But to the idea of going as far as this clearing out of mind had not occurred to him before. For venerable sir, through the wanderers of other sects and are not perhaps the thoroughbreds we imagine that they are thoroughbreds thinking they're not as high in their level of training as they thought they were, he's saying. Though they are not thoroughbreds, we fed them food, the food of thoroughbreds when they came to our homes. And though they are not thoroughbreds, we set them in a place of the thoroughbreds, meaning those of the Buddhist, uh, the one, the Buddhist um, followers, you know, uh, the noble ones. But though the bhikkhus are thoroughbreds, we imagine that they are not thoroughbreds. Though they are thoroughbreds, we fed them the food of those who are not thoroughbreds. And though they are thoroughbreds, we set them in a place of those who were not thoroughbreds. But now, venerable sir, as the wanderers of these other sects are not thoroughbreds, we shall understand they are not thoroughbreds. And as they are not thoroughbreds, we shall feed them food of those who are not thoroughbreds. And as they are not thoroughbreds, we shall set them in the place of those who are not thoroughbreds. So basically it's the prejudicial thing going on here. <laughs> He's gonna say, okay, the Naganka Niputa people, they came before in some, and in some of the other sects that we fed them food, but now we're gonna feed you people the best food. But they one actually the story, this is the end, I'm not gonna read this. It says thoroughbreds about 40 more times, but <laughs> basically he's going to now feed the Buddhist monks the best that he has in his household. But the Buddha cautions him, uh, this is the other part of the story that's not here in the text. He cautioned him, don't turn them away. You know, you still should feed them. And so he encouraged them. He wanted to stop everything. He encouraged them, don't turn them away, but let them come and support them as you see fit and see what to do. And so he continued to feed them, but he gave, the, the first food to the Buddhist monks. Magnificent Master Gotama, magnificent Master Gotama. Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been overthrown, revealing what was hidden and showing the way to one who was lost or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Gotama for refuge into the Dhamma and to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. From today, let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. So this is what happened to uh, Pataliya. And he makes a, gets a clear picture of the importance now you notice one of in uh, I don't know if I did it or not as we were doing it, but the part in the first part about the precepts, you notice that in order to abandon one, you have to be doing another. This is why we're trying to show you that the reason that you don't get the purification of the mind occurring is because if you go we go to retreat and keep your precepts there and you don't keep the precepts all the time, the scars are inside and the scars turn into giving you trouble physically and mentally, you know? And the only way you can change is the brain so that it naturally tends to go to the other side is each time you say, I'm not going to do that anymore. You have to say, I'm going to do this to the brain. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this. Otherwise, you have all these little people trying to keep the books, you know, for everybody's life. And they, at the end of the month, they look and they say, what are these people are letting go of this, but they're not putting anything back. And they keep slipping, slipping because they don't put anything in place of it. What are we gonna do for 40, 50 years? They were always 
uh, doing this. So it must mean when they let go, there's a hole and then that comes back. And when they let go of this, uh, they, they let go of this one for a little while, it, but this is what should come back. I should write in the page, this is what's coming back. And it always does for the person. And why does it? Because you're not paying attention to following instructions. And that was what this was a whole lot about. He's giving you the instructions of how precisely this works. And when you stop doing something you heard and you abandon something, you have to replace it every time. And then you get personality change. Then you get behavioral modification takes place. And that's what this was all about. Learning how to communicate with your brain and learning how it operates so that you can start to change once you know how it operates and you can have a good successful time. So now this is the end of our, um, this sutta. But now we're going to um, do something odd. We're going to say the prayer and then we're going to come back in part two, okay? And we're going to ask questions in part two. So we're going to just say together now this, the prayer and then we'll turn this off and then we'll start again with the question and answers part two. May suffering ones be May suffering, suffering free, one's free and the fear be, be. May the grieving shed all grief and, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for, for the attribution of all kinds of happiness. Of Maybe Maybe in earth, this and all, they will share this power. May they long for the Buddha's discovery. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.